Thanks very much, Jason. Good job. Okay, questions? Hold on, we'll get a microphone for you, Urban. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Urban Laner with uh, DTN, the Progressive Farmer. I was struck by your emphasis on what we measure, especially following um, the talk by um, Keith Fooley that uh, talked about a new measure. Fugly. Of, I'm sorry, I got the pronunciation wrong. It um, talked about a new measure of productivity that would include total factor productivity. Um, how far apart are you uh, from that? Um, what would you, if you could influence what USDA was going to measure with the Global Harvest Initiative and Farm Foundation, what would you have them measure? So we've, World Wildlife Fund's been involved in creating roundtables to set standards for four global commodities. Uh, we're just now starting one on beef. We've done six or eight already on aquaculture species. Our, our sense is that you need to build consensus about what the key issues are, but inevitably they fall to a few issues. Uh, soil health or soil carbon, et cetera, toxicity, water use and water effluence, uh, productivity is, is one of those, uh, but also yield per unit of nitrogen per unit of input is also important. We think that rather than individual measures probably Indexes are important. Altogether, there aren't more than six or eight things that probably need to be measured. There are six or eight things that cause the biggest impacts that you would care about. And they're pretty much the same across different crops, although between tropic and temperate and between annual and perennial, you probably would get a different ranking of which of those are the most important of the same six or eight. But it's not rocket science. You get a group of farmers together, you get a group of academics together, they can pretty much agree, you know, within the first hour uh, what the most important things are. What is an acceptable impact is another whole kind of discussion. And that's going to vary a lot based on where you are in the world, uh, et cetera. But I think the, what I really agreed with about the earlier presentation is we think practices are fantastic. They're great means to an end, but they are not results. We think practices should not be measured. In fact, you can't really measure practices. If you establish what the result is you want on the ground, then you encourage innovation. Because you say to the producers, we're going to be technology neutral. You use whatever technology allows you to achieve this result that doesn't cause some other problem, and you're going to be fine in this system. This practice may work for some, et cetera. Whereas if you say a practice, then you just get compliance and you don't get innovation. And that's what we really need as we're moving forward. Another question. Hi, this is Kristen Daly from the Initiative for Global Development. Thank you for your presentation. This morning we heard a lot about modern agriculture and we've also briefly heard about the need for public-private partnerships. I was wondering if you could talk more specifically about what you could actually see the U.S. government and U.S. corporations coming together around, either on the ground or in policy. Thank you. Well, I think, I think food is still mostly a local issue. If you look at the trade data, less than, certainly less than 10 percent, somewhere in the range of 5 to 8 percent of food is traded internationally. So food is inherently a local issue. But where food is traded, it can have very big impacts on income and on uh, development, et cetera. And that's where I think multinational companies in the private sector can play an increasing role. I don't see a direct connection there with the U.S. government necessarily. I think, I, I personally think the issue is more between the role between governments in general and the private sector in general. I think private voluntary standards, if they're focused on six or eight key issues and the companies start saying we want to buy products that's produced in this way or that way, put conditions on it, banks begin to pick up and reinforce those same six or eight key issues then government can begin to regulate against from the bottom to push up those same six or eight. Because the real issue is that we're not going to improve productivity that much by pulling the top. We're going to improve productivity and resource use by moving the middle, by moving the bottom. 
and government has a real role in that. So does the private sector. But if we can harness these two together, then we can have a team that's working to move both. They don't have to be in lockstep. They don't even have to be in constant discussion. But the two, if they're focused more or less on the same things, will tend to shift the whole curve. One more question. Okay, this will be, Julie, this will be the last one. Julie Howard, Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa. Um, best practice around the world? I mean, are you seeing any place where uh, countries are addressing kind of this basket of factors in a reasonable way? Um, and also sort of looking back at the past, I mean, when you think about how the U.S. dealt with the Dust Bowl, for example, I mean, we had a package of interventions there that helped people understand why they needed to farm a different way. Um, pricing of water, you know, figuring out what we're doing. So. You, you have scared us, <laughs> so, so please give us a little hope, thanks. Okay, well I, I don't actually, I've tried to purge myself of using the term best practice because I don't actually believe there are any. I think it's a, a continuous improvement and I think what we have is better practices and better is always better than worse. Um, but, but in point of fact, today's better practice is tomorrow's norm and the one after that that you're trying to get rid of. There is continuous improvement, and we need to see it that way. We can't get too smug that as soon as we adopt a practice, we're, we're suddenly safe. Um, in terms of innovation, I would say, at least for commodity crops, that right now Brazil is the most, most inventive and uh, innovative producer um, that, I, that I have seen. Uh, I, and I think it's, it's interesting. I th the, the most innovative producers in Brazil were not born as farmers. They came to farming as a business. And they brought with it a whole set of attitudes that are different than a lot of people who grew up on farms. And for example, they understand that if you buy land at 10 cents on the dollar and increase the carbon each year so that in, in five or six years that land is worth 110% of what your neighbor's farm is, then you have actually made more money growing soil than you have growing soybeans. And you can turn around and flip that land and either sell it to somebody else and buy more degraded land, or you can use it as collateral to buy other degraded land and do the same thing again. And that's what's happening. 20 million hectares so far. And that's the kind of thing that's possible. I think there's a lot of innovation in small producer horticulture, in vegetables, in those kinds of things. There's a lot in the U.S., a lot in other countries. And I think those types of systems are more innovative for a couple of reasons. One, they don't tend to be subsidized. I think subsidies kill innovation. Two, they tend to be located near cities where input prices are high and land is high and they really have to be innovative to stay alive. And so if I were looking for where innovation is, where people can afford to pay for water and frequently do and pay regular prices. It's, it's those, those people growing fresh fruits and vegetables that are closer to urban markets. And that's all around the world. That's not just in any one place. All right. Well, Jason, thanks. Good job. We'll give him a hand. <laughs>